Hello family, welcome back to our channel today. Uh, I want to first start out by welcoming you to our Sunday School lesson. I pray that something that is said will help to encourage you and motivate you on your day. If this is your first time to our Sunday School uh, channel, I welcome you. I, I, I pray that you come back uh, and continue to go along with us as we study through God's Word. I'll let you know what resource that we're using as we go through the video and also at the end I'll give you the link where you can get the resources from let us open up in a word of prayer before we do anything else father in the name of Jesus I just come to you right now thanking you for this opportunity that you afforded me Lord God to share your word to share the study of your word with the people that are, are eager Lord God eager to hear from you eager Lord God to uh, learn more about you through your word Lord God so I thank you right now for what it is that you are doing in this season oh God in this season of my life first and foremost Lord God but then then too in the life of the people who choose, Lord God, to come on this uh, channel, Lord God, and to hear a word from you. Lord, so I just thank you. I thank you that you are decreasing me and you are increasing yourself through me, Lord God, using me as the vessel, Lord God, that would deliver your uncompromised word of truth. Lord God, I pray that I only speak your truth, Lord God. I pray that everything that comes out of my mouth is from you, Lord God, and not my own, um, my own own thoughts and my own wordings, Lord God, but yours, Father. So I give you the glory, I give you the honor, and I give you the praise for what it is you're going to do. Lord God, I do plead the blood of Jesus over everyone on this line. Whatever situation they may be caught in right now, Lord God, whether it is illnesses, financial struggles, Lord God, with, children, with their children, marital problems, whatever it is, Lord God, let them understand, Lord, that you are able, Lord God, to make a change, Lord God, make any crooked thing straight, Lord God, that, that, that if they would just seek you first, Father God, that you, Lord God, will work all things out together for their good and for your glory. Lord God, I, I thank you on today for what it is that you're going to be doing in Jesus name. Thank God and amen. So let's get in to our lesson from today. A very good lesson. Our lesson is titled Saul Anointed King. That is what the title of our lesson is. Saul Anointed King. We have scriptures that go along with our lesson. And they are our lesson text is going to be 1 Samuel 9, 25 through 10 and 1 and 6 through 16. So that's uh 1 Samuel chapter 9 verse 25 going to chapter 10 verse 1 and then we're going to jump over to verse 6 through 16 in chapter 10. So then our related scriptures it's going to be uh 1 Samuel 16 1 through 13 that's uh first samuel chapter 16 verses 1 through 13 numbers chapter 11 verses 24 through 30 and first samuel chapter 19 verses 18 through 24 so those will be our scriptures that we're going to be relating to this um lesson on today i'm going to start out by reading our lesson texts and they are that is again first samuel chapter 9 25 through chapter 10 1 and then verses 6 through 16 i'm reading from the niv version as i always tell you that's the version that i like but again you don't have to use that one you can use whatever version you feel more comfortable with as long as you are reading the word of god let's go in um chapter 10 verses 9 let me find it all right Chapter 10, verses 9 through 25. I'm sorry. 1 Samuel chapter 9. That's where I was getting confused at. Uh, 10, um, 20, 25 through 10 and 1. See, and I know if I'm getting confused, y'all gonna get confused too. So let's let's work this together. Okay. 1 Samuel 
chapter 9, verse 25, through chapter 10, verse 1. Let's do that, those first. Okay, and it says, After they came down from the high place to the town, Samuel talked with Saul on the roof of his house. They rose about daybreak, and Samuel called to Saul on the roof, Get ready, and I will send you in your, on your way. When Saul got ready, he and Samuel went outside together. As they were going down to the, e to the edge of the town, Samuel said to Saul, Tell the servant to go on ahead of us. And the servant did so. But you stay here a while so that I may give you a message from God. Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on Saul's head and kissed him, saying, Has not the Lord anointed you the leader over his inheritance? And then we're going to go to verses 6 through 16, and that's a verse of chapter 10. And uh, 6 through 16 says... The spirit of the Lord will come upon you in power and you will prophesy with them and you will be changed into a different person. Once these signs are fulfilled, do whatever your hands find to do for God is with you. Go down the head of me to Galilee. I will surely come down to you to sacrifice burnt, burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, but you must wait seven days until I come to you and tell you what you are to do. As Saul turned to leave to leave Samuel, God char charged Saul's heart. God changed Saul's heart, and all these signs were fulfilled that day. When they arrived in Gad Gad Gadaha, Gabiha, that's it, Gabiha, a profession of the profession of a procession of prophets met him. The Spirit of God came upon him in power, and he joined in their prophesying. When all those who had formerly known him saw him prophesying with the prophets, they asked each other, What is this that has happened to the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? A man who lived there answered, And who is their father? So it became a saying, is Saul also among the prophets? After Saul stopped prophesying, he went to the to the high place. Now Saul's uncle asked him and his servant, Where have you been? Looking for the donkey, he answered. But when we saw they were not to be found, we went to Samuel. Saul's uncle said, Tell me what Samuel said to you. Saul replied, He assured us that the donkey had been found. But he did not tell his uncle what Samuel has said about his kingship. So that is our uh, scripture reading. Today's aim, we're preparing for the lesson. So before we go into the lesson, we prepare for the lesson. And I'll give you today's aim, which is the facts, the principle, and the applications of the lesson. The fact of this lesson is to know that we set ourselves up for disappointment when we do not trust in the Lord. That is a true fact. The principle of the lesson is to realize that while other people will let us down, God cannot fail us at any time. God can do anything but fail. And that's the principle of this lesson. The application is to trust God's faithfulness when circumstances look dire, when things look like they're at their end, when things look dire, when things look uh, like is it, there is no good that's going to come out of it, we should we we should have faith that uh, and trust in God that uh, He is in control when things seem out of control. So let's intro introducing this lesson. Uh, Israel's fine finally received what they had wanted since Samuel had grown old a king to rule over them, but they soon found out that no human being can replace the Lord. So remember on last week in our lesson, uh, the children of Israel, the people of Israel decided that they wanted a king. They didn't want God to reign over them anymore. So they went to uh, Samuel and they said, we want a king. And so Samuel was very upset about it. Uh, he told them that he didn't think it was going to be a good thing. He went back to God and told him what the what the people wanted and God said they're not uh they're not sinning against you they're not against you they're against me as their king so he was telling Samuel so don't feel bad because they the problem they have is not with you the problem they have is with me as their king and so give them what they want so God will turn us he will give us when we want what we want but we 
we will suffer the consequences. Uh, we will have to deal with the consequences of the choices that, that we want to have. And so we'll see some of that take place uh, in this new lesson of, of uh, Saul anointed as king. So they got their very first king, which was King Saul. Okay, so let's get into this lesson. So as I was studying this lesson, um, I wanted to start out by uh, reading from our lesson, uh, the, the introduction. And it says, in ancient Israel, the first kings were chosen by God. In the case of both Saul and David, Samuel was charged with anointing them. But just because they were divinely selected did not mean they were immune to sin. So remember that uh, just because these kings were divinely selected, which means that God instructed, God gave the instruction of who was to be the king, that did not immune them from sin and boy that makes me think of our pastors those that are in leadership just because they have been called to that position it does not mean that uh that they will not be uh be tempted or that they cannot succumb to sin you know they're human they are human, just like we are. And yes, they have a, a greater calling upon their lives, but that doesn't negate the fact that they are still human and they will be uh, put in the same situations that we'll be put in. So we must always take the time out to pray for our leaders, pray for those that are in leadership because they are, they. and to me, sometimes they're tempted greater than we are. So we should we should really lift them up in prayer. Okay, so there are four topics for this lesson on today, and they are uh, Saul consecrated as a king, Samuel's commission for Saul, uh, Saul's char change of heart, and Saul conceals his consecration. So those are the four um, topics, and we'll get into what each uh, the points from each topic. Let's do that right now. The first one, Saul consecrated as king. I have three points that I want to bring out about that. The first point that uh, I want to bring out is the background of the new king. And the background of the new king, uh, I will be reading from our lesson, and it says, At the end of last week's lesson, the Lord told Samuel to honor Israel's request and choose a king for them. As this text opens, we are introduced to Saul, a choice, a, a choice young man. He was the son of Kish, a mighty man of power, meaning he was influential and wealthy. Saul was tall and handsome, just what a king was expected to be. You know, uh, when the children of Israel was looking for a king, when they wanted a king, they wanted someone who represented what they thought a king should look like. And so uh, from our text, it, is, it appears that Saul was truly what they want, what, what they would have wanted with their with their physical eyes and I think about that is that we should not want anyone leading us just because of their physical appearance we should want someone leading us because of their heart's posture because I believe that the heart of a man is 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 more important than the way they look their physical appearance. You know, uh, when you want somebody ruling over you, you want to know that their heart is connected with, with God. Because if it is, then they'll be ruling you with ruling you uh, with God as their authority and not any other aspect. Because a, appearance can change. You know, anything can happen to somebody, appearance, but in, in, and even in the heart, it can change. But if their heart is connected to God, then they're going to uh, respond differently than if it was just, you know, anything else. So then uh, the next point that I have is Samuel meets Saul. So uh, Samuel was in a certain town, presumably Ramah, uh, to offer a sacrifice. The Lord had revealed to Samuel the previous day that a man was coming who was to be anointed king. So you can find that in 1 Samuel 9, 15 through 17. When Saul arrived, he was invited to a, uh, to a sacrifice and feast with Samuel at the high place. And that's in verse 19 and was honored by the prophet. The next day, Samuel prepared to send Saul on his way. 
So that's the beginning meeting with Samuel and Saul. And then the selected king. Uh, in that, our text says, uh, take, take a vial of oil. Samuel, taking a vial of oil, Samuel anointed Saul. The anointing of the oil was symbolized, symbolic of God's approval of the one being anointed and the coming of God's spirit upon that person to empower him in his service. Saul's anointing came privately sometime sometime before his actual recognition or coronation as king. So Saul was anointed privately uh, with just him and Samuel before he was publicly uh, uh, presented to the people. So then um, we're going to move right along. Uh, my next um, topic is Samuel's commission of Saul. And it was two points. Uh, the first point is a spirit promise, the spirit promise. And for that one, our text says, as the anointing had uh, uh, anticipated, Saul was promised that the spirit of the Lord will come upon him. As seen in the book of Judges, the coming of the spirit upon him would enable him to carry out his mission. Saul's ability to prophesy with a band of prophets would be an additional sign that God was with him. More Moreover, Saul would be turned into another man, literally over, overturned or transformed. So when the spirit of the Lord came upon Saul, he was transformed into another man. Uh, that, that means his heart was changed from the way he used to think or the, the things that he used to do to the way God would want him to think and the way God would and doing what God would want him to do. And then um, the next one is sacrifices anticipated. And our lesson says about that Saul was further instructed to go ahead of Samuel to Galilee and import an important religious shrine in Israel. Together, they would offer sacrifices in that place. Saul was to wait there seven days until Samuel arrived. This may have been a test of his obedience. As seen later, Saul would have problems with patience and obedience. So we will get more into that. Uh, the next point topic is uh, Saul's change of heart. And there was three points that I want to bring out about that, well, that, that our lesson wants to bring out about that. Uh, the first point is uh, Saul turned to leave. Um, as he did something extraordinary happen, God gave him another heart concerning the uh, after aforementioned signs. All those things came to pass that day. And then the aforementioned signs were first, Saul would be informed that the donkey had been found. Second, he would meet three men who would offer him food. Third, he would encounter a band of prophets who would prophesy. These were the signs the Lord would give Saul, assuring him of God's presence with him. Uh, a couple of observations came can be made. First, under the old covenant, the coming of the Spirit upon a person did not necessarily mean the Spirit uh, would uh, abide permanently with that individual. Second, even if a person was empowered with God's spirit, it did not mean that he would no longer succumb to temptation. So that was uh, our um, point to the um, signs confirmed. Okay, the, the spirit uh, falls, the spirit falls, our point on the spirit falls is when uh, Saul met these prophets, the spirit of God came upon him. So that's the spirit fall. It became, it came upon him. Actually, what occurred when Saul prophesied is unclear, but to, but to those present, it was evident that the spirit had come upon Saul as he met this prophetic band. So remarkable was the change in Saul that people wondered aloud, is Saul also among the prophets? And the next uh, point on Saul's change of heart is Saul is uh, doubted. And that is on uh, my point number 10. And it's uh, uh, it says not only did Saul uh, not only did some think Saul's behavior strange, but one person also called into question the validity of the whole experience, even ridiculing Saul, um, asking, but who is their father? 
this statement seemed intended to degrade Saul and the prophetic movement in general by raising diversive questions about the circumstances of Saul's birth. Once Saul ceased to prophesy, to prophesy, to prophesy which seems to have been temporarily ph phenomenal, he went on to the place of worship in Geb Geba, in Geba, Gabiha, Gabiha. I can't never get that word right in Gabiha. Okay, then our fourth and last point for our lesson for today is Saul concealed his consecration. And that's uh, two points that I want to make is number one, it was a question and, uh, and, and says one Saul and his servants returned home. Saul's uncle asked where they had been answering truthfully. Saul told his uncle probably near, and, and that's in 1 Samuel 14 and, and 50, that they had been looking for Kish's lost donkey. Saul also told he uh, told him they had visited Samuel the prophet. So both things were true, but he evaded to tell him the second part. Saul's uncle wanted more information concerning this visit. And then the quandary, uh, which was uh, the the uh, Saul's uh, answered response, uh, Saul answered truthfully, but stating that Samuel had told them the donkey had been found. Saul, however, did not volunteer any further information concerning what had occurred in either Samuel's presence or after they had left. Saul said nothing about his private anointing as king of Israel. Time will tell whether Saul had the requ the requisite qualities to be an effective ruler. So time will tell and, and more lessons will come when we will find out more details. So continue to join in so that you will be a part of uh, really seeing God's hand in this story. So that is the end of our lesson portion. And so I want to go into our um, other parts of our lesson, which number one is the practical points of our lesson. We always have some points that go along with this lesson. We have six today. Number one is God can reach us no matter where we happen to be. God can reach you no matter where you happen to be. There's a song uh, I remember where it says, even after he have to dig way down Jesus will pick you up I, that was a song I remember uh, number two to be chosen by God for leadership is an honored but heavy responsibility being a, in leadership carries a heavy responsibility I read this morning and maybe I wrote this down for just this lesson I, did, I was I was it's in Ecclesiastics 1 and 18 and and this is what I wrote the more revealed to us by God the more we will become displeased with what we see uh knowledge we, we get knowledge from God God will continue to pour into us uh but there's a heavy responsibility that goes along with that with that pouring into us from God. Number three, God gives his chosen leaders the power they need for their service. When God calls you to do something, he prepares you for it. He carries you through it till it is completed. You don't have to worry about it. Don't even think about it. Just go. Just move when God say move. He is preparing the way and he will take you through it. Don't depend on your own strength. Depend on the, just be obedient to what God is telling you to do and let him take care of the rest. Number four, believers must be obedient to God's word. As a believer, God's word, God's word in, in this, in his Bible, God's word, we are to, we are to, um, continue to depend on his word we are to be obedient to his word and we are to trust in God's word number five God speaks to people of faith today through his word in scripture yes through I know for me every time I pick up God's word I first ask him what do you what do you want me to get come away from this with what do you want me to get out of? and I encourage you to do that every time you pick up God's word ask him God in this word what do you want me to get out of that and then wait a minute and I guarantee you God will begin to reveal to you what he wants you to know from his word that will that you are to apply to your life 
And uh, number six, the last one, sometimes it is best to stay quiet for a time to meditate on the details of God's call, even with those close to us. Move in silent. That's, uh, I, I, I said I would, uh, at one point, I'm going to move in silent. Sometimes when God speaks to us, it is not a time for us to run out and tell everybody because we don't know the full details of it. And sometimes, n not intentionally, I don't believe some people, they may not understand what it is that God wants to do in your in your life and they will bring up your limitations or what physical limitations may be or whatever and they may put uh, something in you that will hinder you from moving forward but if you keep that until God has given you all of the details everything that he's pur purposing for you to do then you will be able to stand firm in what God wants you to do despite what anybody else says that's my that's my thought on that uh, practical point. Golden text illuminated, and this is just a snippet from our lesson that um, from our golden text, especially from uh, that they want to bring a light on for us to take away from this lesson. And it says, "And the spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and and sent." And shalt be turned into another man. And that is 1 Samuel 10 and 6. When we think of the context of this week's golden text, we may encounter a problem. The description of Saul's encounter with the Holy Spirit sounds remarkable, like how he works in conversation of New Testament believers. First, uh, 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. Yet, Saul tends to be a rather doubtful example of even an Old Testament believer. Saul's life and reign as the first king of Israel began with, with promise but quickly spiraled downward. If, as uh, Samuel testified, Saul actually became another man, why did his transformation not bear more consistently righteous fruit? Uh, leaving aside the question of whether or not Saul represented a true believer who exercised a saving faith, I think our best uh, starting point of understanding him in Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians 10, 11 through 12. Now all things happened upon them, for example, and they are written for our admission upon upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. As many of the greatest writers uh, since Bible times have understood, Saul is a, uh, a cautionary example for us, as are all great tragic figures in history. We can all benefit from being mindful of such a humbling admonition, but hope can be readily found in the sustaining grace of our generous and loving God. Cross-reference John 10, 28 through 29, 1 Corinthians 10 and 13. So I hope that encourages you. Now, my favorite part, research and discussion questions. And oh my, oh my, what some good questions for us to ponder on. Of course, my answers, they are mine, and but I pray that they would help to um, bring some light to you. So when you go and answer these questions yourself, then you will uh, walk away with a better understanding of God's uh, purpose and plan for your life. Number one. Why is it important for believers to have Christian leaders who are obedient to the Holy Spirit? My answer, because all leaders have followers. Uh, hence the title, leader. Um, in the case of a Christian leader who follow Christ, if he or she is not obedient, what type of example would they be? I wouldn't want anyone leading me who doesn't follow the Holy Spirit's leading. Uh, God's word in Galatians 5 and 16 tells us to walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the de desires of the flesh. So, uh, let me see. 
Yes. So that is my answer to number one. So we don't want any our we want our leaders to walk by the spirit so they won't gratify the flesh. And if they're walking by the spirit, there are ex examples for us to also walk by the spirit. So that is my answer to number one. Number two. And number two was a good one, guys. It was so good that I had to stop. I posted the question out on Facebook. And I pray some of the people that answered the question uh, is tuned in so that they can hear my answer. And, um, I mean, we had so many responses to this question. Uh, so uh, the question was, should believers today who have Christ's word and whose sins were paid for by the Lamb of God look for fresh revelation beyond the scriptures? Why or why not? So I have a, a dual kind of thought on this question. My first thought was, okay, looking beyond the scripture. And I thought about when we look beyond the scripture, like other books, other readings, other, other, um, yeah, more about other books and other readings. They're like, like there are these different books that were written and people are using those books uh, and, and bringing them alongside the Bible. So I thought on that. And then the other one was uh, someone brought to thought of looking beyond the scriptures in prayer and looking beyond the scriptures through the man of God or the woman of God to get revelation in that. So I first wanted to um, speak on fresh revelation. So fresh means recently made or obtained, not previously known or used, new or different. So I thought about that. Then revelation, an act of revealing or communicating divine truth, something that is revealed by God or to humans, an act of revealing uh, to view or making known something that is revealed, especially an enlightening, enlightening or an astonishing disclosure, shocking. And there are two types, general and uh, special. General is available to everyone. Special is direct, directly to an individual or sometimes a group. So, and when I mean by types, I mean types of revelation. There's general revelation and special revelation. So those were just the, uh, the thoughts that I wanted to bring about um, new, this new revelation. And so in my first my first thought was when it came to like looking at books and things that uh, these different other uh, writings that 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 are found out there that are that were not put into the Bible. My thought was this: God, if He had He inspired the sixty six books of this Bible, right? So if He had wanted a hundred and sixty six books in this Bible, it would have been in there. So those other books that are written, that were written, if if he wanted it in here, they would have been in here. So the not taking anything away from the um, the accuracy of the time period that those books were written, but um, you know, to me, sometimes when we begin to look at other uh, books and we uh, the word says, don't take nothing away from it or don't add nothing to it. So if we begin to use those books and add things to it, I believe that it will bring about just a, a, a little bit more confusion. And that's one thing that we do not want when it comes to the word of God. So um, I believe that, um, you know, in that regard, I was thinking of it. I was thinking along that line. But then I do believe that uh, outside of the scriptures, when we do pray and when we do uh, hear the man of God and we do gain revelation, most of for the most part, it should be, should bring us back to the scriptures, you know. And so um, we should, everything, anything that we uh, receive a revelation about, it will always, it should always uh, go back to the scriptures. Um, uh, to, you know, we should not allow anything to come uh, to take us outside of what the scriptures are uh, trying to bring us in line with. 
So that was my answer to that. Um, somebody, I, I wrote something down and I'm trying to read it here. It says, don't, don't dive too much outside of scripture because it could lead you astray. That's it. My handwriting was so bad. But don't dive too much outside of scripture because it could lead us astray. I know so many people who have written, written, went to all of these other books and started reading them and now they are contradicting what the scripture says and that's the i think the biggest uh thing that i, I thought about in um and this is that we don't want anything to contradict what the word of god says and anything to me that does that uh is is an issue and and we don't we don't we don't want that so stick with the word of god Stick with the people that are speaking the word of God and, and stick with what you, with the Holy Spirit is revealing to you uh, through your prayer time. So if you don't have a prayer life, you need to start one. Number three, the question is, how uh, dramatic a change should we expect to see in new believers' lives? Are some marks of change easier to mistake than others? So my answer to that uh, is, as an outsider looking in, there should really be no uh, expectation from us, in my opinion. There should be no, really, you know, we don't know what's going on in the heart of a person when they uh, accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, new believers. We should really have no expectation, uh, in my opinion. Uh, however, when the change does take place, it will be noticeable. You will notice the change in a person when uh, a new, especially a new convert, you will notice a change in them when they accept uh, uh, accept God's word in their lives. You, you begin to see things take place. And yes, eternal change may not always be seen. I mean, because first it's, it's happening behind the scenes where we don't, we don't see it. But uh, the more the heart of a person changes outwardly, it will become visible. The more I've, I've seen it, the more a person get in this word, the word is active. The word will change you. The word will change you. So there are some scriptures that... Um that I would like to share with you on, uh, from this thought. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5 and, and 17 speaks of the change that should take place in a believer. So you can go read that. Uh, Ezekiel 36 and 26 speaks about the new spirit and change of the heart uh, for God that, that God gives a person. Uh, and then Romans 2 and 29 speaks of the change of heart that glorifies God. So all three of those scriptures, you can go back on your free time and, and read them and uh, truly uh, apply them to your life. Number four, describe, describe the difference between a theocratic king's rule and the rule of a secular monarchy. So theocratic means uh, relating to or denoting a system of government in which priests rule in the name of, the, of, of God or a God is a form of government in which a deity of some type is recognized as the supreme ruling authority giving divine guidance to human intermediaries that manage the day-to-day -day affairs of the government. A secular monarchy is one in which a king or queen will rule for a lifetime, pass it on to an heir, and it will remain in that family, uh, that family line indefinitely. The difference, the theocratic king's rule, God is the head. A secular monarchy, man is the head. Okay, and then number five, uh, how do new converts become new people in Christ? The cross-reference cross for that is 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. And I want to read that for it to you, uh, but I want to read uh, 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 17 and 18 to you to answer that question. And it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old 
has gone. The new has come. All this is from God who reconciles us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So for me, I believe that uh, to this question, how is a new Kurt, new, how do new converts become new people in Christ is because of the reconciliation that God gave us through Christ, uh, the, through Christ, uh, the birth uh, life, his walk, and his resurrection. And so when we become a new cre a new creation, the old things are gone and the new things uh, have taken place. And so that is my answer to number five. Lastly, number six. And it says, how can believers know that the Holy Spirit has come upon them? Uh, when a person's mind is changed from seeing things the way the world sees or does it to desire to desiring to do that what is pleasing to God. And I, I want you to go to Romans 12 and 2. And I'm going to read that one to you as well. Romans 12 and 2 says, do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. So I thank you again for being a part of uh, this journey with me as we go through the word of God on today. Uh, remember, our lesson comes from uh, our adult Bible study uh, class book. And here is that book right here. You can get it at www.uniongospelpress. Uh, I don't know if you can see that, but I'll try to put it up so you can see it and I will uh, put it in the description for in the description for you of this lesson let us go ahead on and close out in a word of prayer Father God in the name of Jesus I truly do thank you I thank you for this time that you have set aside for your word to go forth Lord God I pray that the life of Saul Lord God is an example for each one of us Lord God how to uh, trust you obey you Lord God and to live a life pleasing unto you, O oh God. Lord God, I pray, Lord God, that we uh, use this uh, to apply to our lives and share with others, Lord God. I pray that this message, Lord God, falls in the hands, Lord God, of someone who truly needs it, Lord God, who need guidance and direction in this time, Lord God, who are making decisions, Lord God, and who is uh, at a crossroad in their life, Lord God. And I pray, Lord God, that you begin to minister to their hearts, Lord God, and to make a change. Lord God, that will be seen outwardly, Lord God. But Lord God, I know it all starts internally. And I thank you, Lord God, that you are working on even our hearts, Lord God. And Lord God, you are making a change in us. And so for that, I say thank you, oh God. Lord God, I just give you the glory and the honor. I pray you continue to cover and keep us, protect us from all hurt, hurt harm and danger, Lord God. Use us to your glory, O oh God, is my prayer. I thank you in Jesus' name. Thank God and amen. Thank you all for being a part of this. I pray, Lord, I pray that something that was said minister to you. Thank you all so much. Until next time, bye.